This is Aliens and Artists in conversation with Anna Bagayan. I'm your host, Stuart Davis. Anna is an artist whose fascinating work explores a range of anomalous subject matter from alien human hybrids, abduction, greys, and more. She refers to her art as future realism. You know, I think my uh, life was pretty normal up until the point where I watched a movie about aliens, and then I think the strange things started from there. So I was painting these big-eyed children before the aliens came into the scene. And about 10 years ago, I watched this movie called The Fourth Kind. And it was about a psychiatrist and one of her patients was having these experiences that uh, she eventually found out might have been alien abductions. And the movie said that it was based on a true story. And so this was the first time I had ever really heard of alien abductions being anything other than uh, just fictional characters in a movie. So I decided to go researching that, those claims um, to see why they were saying that. And that opened my eyes up to the alien abduction phenomena and how people claim to have actually been visited by aliens. So this was the first time that I had really heard about that. Before that, it was just little green men and movie characters. What were you feeling when you watched The Fourth Kind? I imagine you'd seen other science fiction as aliens generally figure in popular culture. So what was it about The Fourth Kind that was so distinctive? Did it disturb, mesmerize? What was so indelible about it? It was supposed to be a horror movie. So the fact that it was based on a true story, I think, scared me. And when I feel fear about something, I tend to want to know more about it so I can you know, debunk it or find a good reason to be scared. So that movie um, also combined the alien abduction scenario with um, being possessed by the devil and things like that. So they were definitely trying to emphasize the fear in the movie and um, make you feel a certain way. And that's what I found uh, through my research is that a lot of science fiction and films do portray aliens as this uh, villain that we're supposed to fight against because it just makes better entertainment. When you began to do more research, what did you find that contrasted or contradicted abduction as a fearful entertainment trope? And what were your sources? John Mack, Bud Hopkins, Yvonne Smith? What happened from there, around the same time I had just met my husband, and I had mentioned to him that I watched this movie. And he apparently was already familiar with um, the alien abduction thing. So he was like, oh, yeah, they, you know, people, like, people say that it's happened to them before. And he started showing me um, some documentaries and footages, or, sorry, <laughs> footage, things like that, of people talking about their experiences. And what surprised me was that they weren't all negative experiences, that some people were interbreeding with these aliens to create a new type of human. Um, some people had relationships with their abductees. Some people talked about how they felt loved and protected as they were going up. So there was a mix of um, different types of experiences, but I was surprised to find that so much of it was actually a positive thing. There is a vaguely eerie atmosphere to your work, and yet it's also enchanting, beguiling, mesmerizing. How consciously cultivated is that odd, othering presence your paintings are suffused with? What happened was when I started understanding what was happening to people, I started feeling what they might have been feeling, and whatever I'm interested in or whatever I'm looking at tends to get filtered out through my art. So around that time, there was a lot of uh, positive emotions happening within me because I had just fallen in love and had, you know, found something new and exciting for my imagination to create pictures from. So all of those feelings that I was having, I put in, into my characters. And I also realized why it was important for me to make some positive depictions of aliens in our future. It's because there wasn't too many around for people to look at. You know how we hear 
about how we're all connected to each other. I realized pretty recently that the connection that we have to each other is very much through this physical world that we live in together. And so when someone puts out an image that may not have existed before, that makes it available for other people to perceive and feel as well. So we, my husband and I came up with the term future realism to um, represent that idea of creating a positive image of the future for everyone to be able to see and um, use their imagination to co-create that reality. It's an interesting response to the pervasive negativity in entertainment depictions of non-human entities, which is chiefly predicated on fear. Your work, Future Realism, supposes our artistic life may have the power to change the nature of our anomalous experiences which is not an artistic strategy we've seen a lot of. There's a glut of the bad and a dearth of more dimensionally rich work. When I view your work, I don't find it to be merely romanticized renderings of the human, non-human ecosystem. There's an oblique, strange tension there. Um, I intentionally try to keep the characters a little bit mysterious. Because what happened when I first found out about aliens is it expanded my imagination and it felt really good to experience that for the first time. So I want people to not have the whole idea from looking at my picture, but be able to add to it through their imagination. So keeping some things a little bit mysterious leaves it open to interpretation. And I try to think of ways to depict other realities. So for example, um, I'll take an existing painting and I'll digitally invert it so that the colors are the opposite of what we would normally see. And that does something to your brain when you look at something that's kind of unusual and you want to flip it back to what it really looks like. I want anything that I can do physically with paint that is unusual and not normally done, if that makes sense. Because I'm trying to get you to imagine something that doesn't exist, and that's really difficult to do. Makes sense. Yes. You're adjusting the orienting points of reference, disrupting our interpretive bias to allow for a fresh encounter. One thing I find fascinating about your work is that you're not an abductee, not a contactee in that sense. Is it something you would wish to experience? Did reading accounts dissuade you? pretty open to you know being taken somewhere cool (laughs) but the reality is if i saw something unusual my first reaction would be to be a little spooked just because i know when i see someone that i know but it's a surprise i get spooked so seeing something that's unusual like that would probably scare me at first but at least i have this background of researching them and portraying them in a positive way to fall back on. At least that's what I'm hoping. I think that it's not that I necessarily believe every story I hear about aliens and UFOs, but I think it would be foolish to just write them off completely, especially since um, with UFOs and spaceships, there's been enough people from the military and astronauts and pilots um, who have who have seen strange things flying for us to at least consider that this is really happening. Have many experiencers reached out to you as a result of your artwork? People have reached out to me, some uh, family members and friends to tell me about strange things that they've seen in terms of lights and things like that. Um, I do get emails often from people I don't know telling me that they've had experiences with the type of beings that I portray and how it's helped them to be able to see these things that they normally only see in their minds. So to have someone um, take that out of your mind and create a physical picture, I think has been a soothing experience for some people. How do you feel when you receive those accounts? It makes me feel good because that was the original intention of them was to take this a little bit more seriously and do it in a loving way so that when I hear from people saying that 
the experience that they're having from seeing the pictures, it makes me feel like, like it was, you know, worth the change that I had to go through for my art to look like that. What was the change you had to go through? Describe the developmental movement from point A to point B in that regard. Well, I've been an artist for a professional artist for about 15 years. And the first five years of my art career was illustration background. And I started doing fine art with um, some of the illustration work that I was doing. So my work looked totally different before and after the alien thing. I was showing with galleries and a lot of my work was, um, again, portraits of children, but there was a lot more sadness and that type of emotion, which I think people can really relate to. So for my work to change almost overnight from these sad orphan children to these mysterious, um, more positive, cosmic looking big eyed children, for me, it wasn't a huge change, but for other people, it was. And so around that time, my gallery that I was showing with didn't really know how to explain the change to collectors. And they asked me to not make things so alieny. But it was already too late. Once I become inspired and go down a certain direction, it's really difficult for me to go backwards. So I think of uh, my style, not so much that I go from point A to point B without anything in between, but it's almost like a carving out of the style. And every once in a while, something will happen to really inspire a big change. And other times it's just small things one after the other. But it took a long time for my existing collectors to understand what I was doing because it I had already gone through all this research of aliens and suddenly I was making people aware of it who weren't aware of it in the first place. So now they had to do the research to kind of catch up to it. So it's, it's been an interesting process of believing in myself and sticking with it, even if I had to make a lifestyle change to continue making art as a living. A recurring theme among artists who've chosen to focus their work on non-human entities is that it often derails their careers, especially the further back you go in time. It's a relief it's taken root and flourished in your case because we hear so many accounts of artists whose careers have been lost because galleries and proprietors refuse to touch anything to do with UFOs or non-human entities, etc. Did you have a period where you worried this subject might torpedo your career? Yes. So what happened when I realized selling the alien paintings wasn't going to be as easy as my other work, um, I decided to leave Los Angeles. So my husband and I packed up. We moved over to Big Bear, which is a couple hour drive from Los Angeles in the mountains. And we, I don't want to say downgraded our lifestyle it was actually more of an upgrade but we just found a way to make a living off of less so that I can continue focus on making art that might have been a little bit more difficult to sell but what also happened was I became a little bit more independent in selling my own work so the, especially on social media people that were following me because they loved the alien stuff when I was making art in the mountains, I tried to focus on making them smaller so that they would be affordable for people who weren't necessarily art collectors, but wanted to have these images and wanted to support artists that were creating them. Um, so through the process, I became more independent in selling my own art and less reliant on galleries and illustration work to make a living. Your husband sounds cool. He was totally on board with these changes. My husband and I had just met, so uh, and we got married pretty quickly. So we didn't really know each other too well in the beginning, but he wanted to be a stand-up comedian. So he was an artist of a different kind, and we both just kind of understood how important it was to pursue these creative dreams that you have. So we were willing to do whatever it took to continue having the artistic lifestyle of our dreams, if that makes sense. It does. Do you still live in Big Bear or did you go back to LA? We lived in Big Bear for about three years. And while I was making art and selling it and stuff, it was still pretty difficult to make a living. 
And what happened was after three years, the person that we were renting our house from, we had a two bedroom cabin with a front and backyard. So it was really nice setup. They decided to sell the house. And so our choices were to find another place up there or sell everything and go on a road trip. So that's what we did. We left Big Bear and year traveling around the perimeter of the USA and traveling and making art was a dream of mine from the beginning because I knew doing illustration I could work from anywhere I work from home which is where my studio is so what happened was my studio became the car and because I had been selling art on my Etsy shop through social media I was able to downsize into the setup of the car and continue living like that as we traveled. And when I said that a lot of the magical stuff started happening after I found out about the aliens and after meeting my husband, um, when you're on the road and your only way of making a living is, you know, making art and hoping that it sells, you have to rely a lot on just the universe providing for you. So we got to experience a lot of strange and magical things like meeting people that just popped out of nowhere to help us out with something. There was actually one major thing that happened during the road trip that kind of crystallized the whole alien thing for me so I can get to that. Let me go back a little bit. So before our road trip, we left Big Bear and we stayed at my husband's sister's house for a couple of months while we waited to get our deposit back and get moving with our road trip. So there was a point where um, it was, it had been a particularly difficult time for me in terms of selling art. And I was feeling a bit emotional and I was in the shower and I looked out the window and I just asked for a sign that I was on the right path with my art. So within two days, I got an email from one of the galleries that I had worked with in the past. They had taken one of my alien drawings to an art fair and Takashi Murakami had come across it and purchased it. So I got this email from them um, congratulating me on the sale. He's a very famous artist who does the happy face flowers. And he did Kanye West, West album cover. So he's very well known and respected in the art world. So for me, to having Takashi's support kind of solidified the fact that I was painting aliens and that was the right path for me. I, there's a quote from him that said the role of the artist is to show us the future. And I think that's probably what he was connecting to. I had a drawing of these alien children all holding hands. And he said that what drew him to it was the feeling of the drawing. So what I said earlier about taking all of these positive things that I was feeling and trying to put it into the artwork really resonated with a certain type of person and that happened to be Takashi Murakami. A couple months later while we were in Seattle, Washington on our road trip, I got a message from Takashi Murakami again asking me if I would do a show at his gallery. He had just received that drawing in the mail and loved it and was reaching out to me on Instagram to offer me a show. So what happened was because we were on the road trip I saw on his Instagram that he was going to be in Seattle around the same time, about a week from where we, from when we were there. So I asked him if he wanted me to stick around a little bit longer and to meet up with him at this gallery that he was having a show at so that we can meet and confirm the show. And because we were on this road trip, I was able to meet up with him and confirm a show. So from there on, the rest of my road trip was working on these alien paintings for Murakami's gallery. So it was a very interesting synchronicity and having his support really gave me the fuel that I needed to carry on making art during this road trip. But I had now double the workload. I was making art to sell, to fund the road trip. But at the same time, I had to make a whole new set of artwork that I couldn't sell until I had the show. But because I had so much excitement and this renewed sense of purpose that I was, I somehow managed to do it all. Looking, looking at it now from, you know, several years later, 
it was really the most difficult experience I've had to go through was making art and not just as a living, but while traveling and while trying to prove to whoever that this was my art now. It was a really special experience to have gone through that and had the support of someone um, notable from the art world. Did that confirmation from Takashi Murakami responding so strongly to your work featuring non-human entities, did that spur any change in your spiritual life or inward practices, rituals? What else shifted for you? One of the things that researching aliens led me to was, one, researching science, and two, it introduced me to the world of metaphysics. So one of the things that my husband and I came across when we were first looking for things to watch was Bashar, the uh, the channel Daryl Anka. Um, I don't have you heard of him? Yes, I'm very familiar. In fact, Ruben Langdon, who was just on the show in the previous episodes, shared some very wild Bashar stories. But yes, I know of, of Bashar's work. So we came across Bashar through the internet and he was in Los Angeles. So we went to a couple of his shows and that was really the first time I really learned about reality creation and how the things that we focus on in our minds can affect the world that we experience in person. So that introduced me to creative visualization and meditating. I don't meditate uh, by ritual, if that makes sense. Like I don't have a certain time or type of meditation that I do. I feel like it's more embedded into my creation, creative process by this point. But in the beginning, I started using creative visualization as my meditation. So instead of re- listening to recorded meditations, I started visualizing paintings that I wanted to make in my mind. And I realized that I had already been doing that. I was just more conscious of it now. So when I say metaphysics, I, what I'm really referring to is things that happen in our minds that are then confirmed physically. Does that make sense? It does. Look, I've been (laughs) on a 30 year frolic in the metaphysical. The weird is the way. But your sharing that does conjure a question about creativity itself. One way of experiencing art is as a something that comes from nothing. One moment there's nothing, the next there's a painting, a song, a building. The human lineage is to dip our being into the void and conjure something from the great gestating nothing. I'm curious what your experiences have been in that regard. When we trace the metaphysical breadcrumbs back to their source, where does your art, or for that matter, where does anything emerge from? You know how sometimes we get these stupid ideas in our minds and we usually dismiss them? I take note of them and I run with them. So if I'm studying something, like let's say I'm reading a book on quantum physics or something, and I get an idea in my head that has nothing to do with what I'm reading, but it pops into my mind. I will stop whatever I'm doing to go make a note of it. And so I think of the creative process as planting these little seeds that eventually will bloom into more complex ideas and then become a physical object. So I, I, I think it's a very organic process for me and a lot of what I'm interested in gets filtered into my work because that's just how my brain works. It takes new information, processes it. It takes new ideas, processes them for a little bit and then just starts sending me images to look at. And I'm a very visual person in in my mind as well. And so when I get an idea, it's usually like in full color, moving, even though my paintings are just two-dimensional, in my mind, they're moving and have a story behind them. So my job is to find a way to capture what I'm seeing in my mind and help everyone else see it as well. I really relate to that listening quality, not dismissing, but honoring the oddities, asking them in. I feel like that instinct is critical to artists and artistry. To what degree do you feel your 
creations are alive and independent from you. Writers, for instance, report characters showing up fully formed with their own opinions, preferences, directing the artist to do their bidding. In that sense, much of creativity is simply listening. To what degree do you feel some works have a life of their own? My work is very character-based. So I think when I'm trying to paint somebody, I have to put myself in their shoes and understand them from that perspective. And so I understand how you're saying that they talk to you and tell you what they need. Sometimes in the unfolding of the image, the decisions are made as more of it becomes visible to you. Does that make sense? So in my head, sometimes I'll talk to myself as that character. And sometimes it's very silly, but you know, nobody has to hear any of that. I don't know if you're familiar with my Anna's Dollhouse project. It's basically a miniature, miniature world of my art life. So all of the art in it are originals. They're still alien paintings. I have alien characters in there as artists. But one of the things that happened was it, it, I originally made it as a, kind of like a marketing tool for my social media. But as I was turning it into a gallery and making art for it and bringing in dolls, what happened was they started talking to each other and their characters just came out. It wasn't something that I was expecting, but because I had created this world, it just opened up these different bubbles of character personalities that all I had to do was hold on to that character and move it around and the narrative would just come out. So what started off as just this, um, you know, marketing idea turned into making comics, which is something I never thought I'd be doing. Uh, and not, I was never a writer or anything like that. And now I'm writing jokes to go with these doll characters that I have. <laughs> Do the jokes sometimes come from the characters themselves? This project, because it's something that I'm doing just for myself on the side, what happens is I wait for the inspiration to strike and then I make the scene. So I know my characters. Some of them are based off of real artists in the real world. And I have to actually absorb their personality and then make new art as that artist in the miniature world. So, so what was the original question? To what extent do you feel characters, artworks may have an animate and distinct existence? There's such presence in your work. I wonder if you feel they have their own volition or native realms, etc. The way that I make art is very similar to how kids play with toys and my dollhouse project has been a very good example of that kids tend to make up characters and have imaginary friends and when i allow myself to do that through my art i think it's the same exact process i'm just an adult now that that i'm doing it but it's acceptable because i found a way to use it as part of my art practice and um, make money doing it. So it's more work than play, but it's really the same process that a child produces imaginary friends, sometimes out of necessity. Being an artist is also a very lonely thing. So all these cr characters that I'm creating um, take on a life of their own and they become I don't want to say my friends, but I think of them as, you know, my children. Sometimes I call them my babies. <laughs> so to me, once it, I create the image, it can take on a life of its own. And especially when other people look at the art, I'm sure they're creating their own version of what I intended to create. That's why I like to leave my art very open-ended so that other people can continue adding to the story if they want to. Such an important facet of the artistic life. That unguarded vulnerability at work when an artist is truly unselfconsciously at play. Much of what you've shared thus far underlines the practical hurdles an artist faces. How do I make a living? Find shelter? Pay bills? How do I promote my work? Obtain an environment suited for the physicality of creating? It can erode that sense of wonder. So, how do you safeguard your enchanted wonder? that which allows you to play and create with that childlike 
perspective? I think I find a way to enjoy the parts of it that are usually less pleasurable. Like most people don't enjoy the selling part of being an artist or the marketing part, but because I like to study science, I also like learning about psychology and so much of marketing is just knowing human psychology, which I find really fascinating. And so I think of that as art as well. It's one thing to know strategies and things like that, but it's another to be able to use those strategies to create something that's for promotional purposes, but it's also entertaining for the viewer as well, rather than just being something to sell. Does that make sense? Completely. As someone devoted to rendering these subjects in a compelling way, what are your personal views on abduction, contact, UFOs, aliens? There's been a nova of late in the media. What's your current impression on what is behind the anomalous phenomena? Well, a couple of days ago, I went to look for some reference pictures on UFOs, and I did notice that a lot of the Articles that came up were from major news sources. I even took a video of it because I was actually pretty surprised. And it was the same captions that I'm used to seeing on uh, fringe journalism, but now it's it says CNN, NBC. So I was thinking maybe they're getting ready to announce something and, you know, they want to be the first to announce it, not just regular people. And I don't know if you noticed today, uh, Virgin Galactic had a space flight where they launched um, two pilots uh, out past the Earth's atmosphere into space so that they could see the full Earth from there. I think that before we were very reliant on these official announcements for um, seeing... Uh, we're reliant on these official announcements, but moving forward, I think as more people are, have access to the skies, we're going to be seeing a lot more of it. I have a feeling it's going to be, you know, people from Mars telling us to back off. <laughs> that seems like the most realistic to me. But I, I mean, I believe in aliens. I, like I said, I don't necessarily believe every story I hear. I would have to know that person's history in order to pass judgment. But I think it's, uh, it's a very exciting thing to think about. And just the fact that we exist means other people have to exist other places. And there could be some just in our own solar system that we don't know about. So to me, usually the simplest answer is the truth. Be sure to catch part two of our conversation with Anna Bagayan, which is its own exclusive full plus episode. We discuss her collection of dead things, how her relatives respond to her catalog of non-human entity paintings, cross-cultural reaction to her work, and you keep saying quantum. I do not think that word means what you think it means, but only for plus listeners. What is plus? You've never heard of it because we're the first and only podcast to offer a paid version of the show. Why hasn't anyone else done this? I ask myself every time I masturbate. We invented plus for the same reason we started the podcast. Didn't exist. There were no podcasts. Why are there no podcasts? We wondered aloud. We made one. Then felt, why doesn't anyone offer subscriptions for fuck's sake? Low hanging fruit much? Low hanging fruit was my nickname name in college. Plus is transformative. You've attended a Tony Robbins seminar. Plus makes him look like a flaccid lingam on a torpid sloth. Plus members coach life coaches out of their thinly veiled depression. Plus members always stick their dismount. Plus members receive bonus episodes by osmosis. Plus members have no vestigial organs. Plus members have plus members. Plus members know why Pat Benatar wore that green glove in the video for We Belong. Click the link in the show notes to multiply your minus into a plus. Literal little alien lady, or Utsuro Bune. February 22, 1803, Japan. Local fishermen in the Hitachi province observed an odd ship in area waters. They towed the vessel ashore. It was 10.8 feet high and 17.8 feet wide. Its appearance similar to an incense burner or a gargantuan rice pit. Its upper portion seemed to be constructed of rosewood. 
the lower portion gilded in metal plating. There were windows comprised of crystal or glass fitted with bars trimmed with resin. When they peered into the windows, they found it to be adorned with texts in an unknown language. They discovered two bed sheets, a bottle of water, cake, and meat. And most significantly, a beautiful young woman, appearing to be around 18 years of age. She stood under five feet tall with red hair and red eyebrows. She wore ribbon-like white extensions in her hair. Her skin was very pale pink in hue. Her clothing was very fine, although witnesses could not identify the exotic fabric. She spoke, no one understood her. She was spoken to, but in turn did not comprehend the Japanese language. She seemed friendly enough, but her behavior was odd. She clutched a 24-inch square box made of pale, shaded material, and she would not allow anyone to touch it. They did make repeated attempts. Some speculated perhaps she was a princess from an unknown state. There are multiple accounts of this cultural alien event. In one, it is said the woman had an affair with a local man. A scandal ensued. The man was put to death. The woman was exiled, but spared her life set back to sea in her odd craft. In another version, she lived a long life where she landed. Theories abound that she was perhaps Russian or Chinese. The artwork depicting this event is quite beautiful, and we link to it in the show notes. Some depictions of her ship look quite like flying saucers. None of them, however, reveal what was in that box. I mean, my kingdom for a Pat Price or an Ingo Swan to tell us what was in that box. Shout out to our aliens and artist listener Catherine for bringing Utsuro Bune to our attention. Aliens and Artists is brought to you by The Liminal Muse, offering one-on-one work with me, Stuart Davis. Sessions focus on transpersonal hypnotherapy, mysticism, creativity as a spiritual path, and more. Go to theliminalmuse.com to book a session, or click the link in the show notes. Also, The Experiencer Group. If you're an experiencer of anomalous phenomena, explore our community of bright, kind, and deep members who connect and receive support within the haven of our private site. Groups include near-death, out-of-body, lucid dreaming, mediumship, channeling, precognition, contact with non-human entities, UFOs, and more. Click the link in the show notes to become a member and become a part of positive anomalous culture. The Experiencer Group. Get caught. 